Welcome to the Dignity Dialogue with your host, Joe Kittinger. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Dignity Dialogue podcast with Joe Kittinger. I am Joe Kittinger. April cannot join us today, but she will be back. She isn't going anywhere. Uh, Today's topic is about money. And in, in our experience as you coach folks, and something that I personally had to, um, I guess, get my head around, money is such a scary topic. It's, we get fearful of it. If we make a lot of money, we're afraid to tell people that in fear of judgment. Um, I think people, it, it's been said, I think Mandela said, um, our true fear is not failure, it's success and how we will be treated if we reach these high pinnacles. When you see super successful people, uh, they get judged a lot. They get criticized, they get poked fun at. We see that on social media. You see that with Taylor Swift. Do you know that Taylor Swift potentially for the second time in a row would have all 10 of her songs in the top 10 list? Amazing, that is a goat, greatest of all time. No one can compare to the goat of Taylor Swift. And she's like 34 years old. So Taylor definitely, love you girl, um, has made an impact and had been criticized, especially in her younger years. And she still is criticized by the, by the jealousy and the ignorance of, of others who just wish they had her success. Okay. And so we see that. And so we have to get our head around, uh, success and with success comes money. And so I think it's such an important subject to talk about. And I want to introduce you to our guest, Eunicia Pere. She is from Excelstra Wealth. She is a consultant and she will explain what Excelstra Wealth does for people. Um, and, uh, She's just an amazing, amazing woman, a great person of knowledge. So, Anicia, welcome to the Dignity Dialogue, where we can dignify money. We don't have to be scared about it. Let's dignify money, Joe. I'm so happy to be here with you. (laughs) We are just thrilled. So why don't you give our audience just an overview of what you help people do, uh, a little bit about your business, and then we'll get into this, I guess, this uh, mindset of money. And you've certainly faced a lot of folks in your career who have this mindset negative of money or maybe positive. We'd love to hear both. You know, we'll talk about specific examples because I know that oftentimes resonates with as you're listening to this. Yes, we will talk about examples (laughs) so that it's easy. Um, But as far as what Excelstra does, think of us as the company, the team, myself, as someone that is truly behind helping our clients keep more of what they earn keeping more, investing more in a way that makes them resonate with their money in the way in a way that makes them uh, not run away from their money story, but rather leaning in and let's face it, having fun with it. And the way that we do that is through a three-pronged approach where we focus uh, our clients are typically successful business owners as well as executives. We work with a lot of uh, physicians on figuring out how do we minimize taxes in a strategic way for today, right? We, this is a problem that a lot of individuals are facing. And frankly, um, unfortunately, unless those uh, unless an individual is in the $100, $200 million net worth threshold, most most individuals do not have access to, to true tax strategies that are, are frankly part of the tax code. So they're part of your right to step into that. And that's what we bring to our clients when it comes to helping them minimize the tax their tax exposure in legal ways. Um, when we're thinking about how money grows, oftentimes what we see is individuals, to your point, being afraid of money, not resonating with what is happening with their money, not understanding what is it that this money is supposed to even do for them. And because of that, they go through life and they invest and they think that they're, you know, they they learn to use the buzzwords, we're diversified. But when we think about diversification, in our world, it's more than just a wheel uh, with pretty little colors. It, it goes 
far beyond that in 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 areas that help clients resonate with where their money's at and what is it doing in ways that are aligned to how they see money, how they see life, how they see growth, what is passion to them when it comes to just being right? And yes, we do bring that to the money. And then third, and but not not li- not last, um, we focus on on working and helping individuals think about their exit strategy. Whether it be because they're thinking about retirement, whether it be because they're thinking about selling a company, whether it be because they're just wanting to figure out what is next. What does 2015, 10, 15, 20 years down the road look like for them? And helping work that problem backwards. Because what we're finding is that too many individuals are so myopically looking at where are they today that we forget to look at the at the future. And unfortunately, that is such a hard proposition for most that it just isn't done. And so we've identified that we need to do that because if we don't do that, the $1 will be $1. And my f- motto is that if we have $1, we need to figure out how to actually multiply it and how it comes back to us. So that's what we do in a nutshell. Well, it sounds to me then that you're not influenced by uh, if you buy this uh, portfolio, I get a commission. <laughs> no, not at all. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I love that you brought that up because that was actually one of the one of the challenges that I, I saw. So my my um, my experience, my expertise growing up in this world has has been on the strategy consulting, always focused on the office of the CFO. So I've been around finances basically my entire professional life. And when I started working with individuals, specifically when it comes to the personal and smaller businesses, what we noticed was that the industry is not incentivized to say, hey, we need to do what's right for the client. Not because somebody is a, a fiduciary, which by the way, we are fiduciaries, but oftentimes individuals hide behind the I'm a fiduciary and and they have to do the right thing for their clients because the law tells them so. I find that I found that to be infuriating because oftentimes in most cases actually what that ends up leading to is to your point exactly, individuals being put into strategies, individuals being put into products, financial products and investments that are not they might benefit the client. Let's not let's not say that they don't. But could they be benefiting the client even more if they were structured in such a way where, you know, everything, the cost is cut down to a minimum. Unfortunately, though, who wants to take a pay cut? And so that was one of the big problems that we had to figure out for us so that we can step in and help our clients in a way that was never aligned to, is the client going to buy something? Whether they buy or they don't, that's not our problem. Our problem and our what we focus on is making sure that clients, to your point from earlier, they resonate and they understand what are their options in a way that's meaningful to them because everything else then takes takes care of itself. Well, you call yourself a consultant, but I think you're kind of a coach. I we could be both. Of, we we could be both, be both, but because but because coaches have such a negative trajectory in the marketplace, right? Nobody wants to be coached. What we also learned is that nobody wants to educate themselves. They just want to get it done for yeah. them. And so, uh, we're, I call we call ourselves wealth uh, wealth strategy consultants because I grew up in consulting and I know what that looks like. I know what it looks like to figure out problems, identify the solutions, identify how we're going to implement them to make sure that we come on the other side stronger. Awesome. Well, then let's get into our subject of why money is such a stigma in most people's mind. I don't want to talk about money. I don't want to share with you how much I make. I don't want to, you know, there's compare and contrast in your 20s, 30s, 40s, how much are you making versus how much I'm making. There's, there's guilt. There's all these emotions that are surrounded with this concept of money, which is technically just a concept. It's this piece of paper and it represents something and we agree on what it represents. And so now we trade services because of this. So let's talk to us a little bit about that, this stigma and mindset that you run into that people have these roadblocks around this topic of money. You know, it's a huge topic in itself, Joe, because uh, just recently I was talking to a very successful um owner of a dental practice. And and the philosophy was, um, why would I pay for expert services when I can just get the free? Um, and, he, and the equivalent that was given to me was, it was hilarious actually, because his question was, I'm just learning how to walk. We're rebounding from a major blunder that had happened 10 years ago with where, where they were take, gruesomely taken advantage of financially. And I, we know a lot of people, if you're listening to this and you've been taken advantage of financially, please know you are not alone. Um, and, and, and this individual and, and his spouse, it was, not, it was not anything different that had happened to them. And so 
it's the idea of just trying to get back on their feet. And so when we started talking, they said, you know, it, it's we can we can go straight into the BMW 700 series when we just started learning to drive, and maybe we should be in a 400 or a 300 series. And I sat there and I thought to myself, oh wow, where you're bringing a car analogy to the conversation. And what popped in my head was, listen, you're actually because of how large your practice is, you're driving a Ferrari, you're managing a multi multi multi-million dollar practice, but you're thinking so small because you've been hurt so badly that it's okay for us to take baby steps. Well, how can we take baby steps when we're in our 50s and we're already by all stretch of the imagination and by all means, we're playing catch up. Do we? Can we afford ourselves to take baby steps? And unfortunately, way too many individuals, because they put themselves in this situation where they think, I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough. I'm not ready today. I'll be ready in two years. What ends up happening is we see those same individuals evading the problem and evading it again. And the year and the two years and the three years pass by. And then we realize that they're in retirement and now there's no turning back. They want to retire, but there's no turning back. And when we look at the lost opportunities for most of our typical type of clients, that means hundreds of thousands, if not millions and millions of dollars. But because the mindset isn't strong enough to say, I have to take a chance on myself, kind of like with dignity, right? You have to lean in and say, I want to do the hard work. I want to figure out what works for me, maybe what works for the people or doesn't work for the people that I work with. And how can we get to a place where we can just have fun? Most people do not look at money as fun for sure. Right. Well, they don't have guidance on it and how to see it. I remember when I was going through my roadblocks and it's, 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 it's my upbringing. I was, I was raised conservatively, but very comfortably. It wasn't, uh, it was just comfortable. You know, uh, we had, uh, our friends, my parents' friends had yachts and we had a little pea green Brady speedboat that we had for 20 years. <laughs> I even adopted it when I was a young adult. Um, they had the condos in the nice areas of the resort areas of Wisconsin, we had a campsite. So my mother prided herself on saying, we have everything our rich friends have. It's just that, you know, uh, we just do it differently. And so this conservative, conservative, conservative. And then as you become more successful, I remember hearing, and and I've got these lovely, lovely folks, um, parents meaning, and uh, saying, oh my gosh, you're putting in a swimming pool, like you're gonna spoil your children. And I pointed out that I have four other siblings Three of them all have swimming pools and one belongs to a country club. <laughs> and their kids are just fine. Mom, you always taught us you can't spoil a kid with too much love. I said, we're, we're spoiling with love and it's, the pool is for us. <laughs> there you go. Danica, it's Danica a great excuse. <laughs> Danica wants a pool. So it's just these kind of conversations, right, that you have as you go through things. And, and one uh, a person shared with me, a wise person shared with me how I look at money and how you charge for your services and uh, he said, money is nothing more than trust points. So if you're going to charge, you know, $3,000 or something, I trust you. I'm giving you 3,000 votes that I believe you can deliver what you say you can deliver. So true. And that and helped- unfortunately, unfortunately, though, what we're seeing, especially in the financial services community, and this comes from clients that have, have joined us, is, there's a question at one of our retreats uh, last year. Who can I trust, Unicia? Who can I trust? This came from a very, very well do, well-to-do individual who owned multiple um, uh, medical practices, and the question was, "Who can I trust?" Because I've already spent all of this money, and I got everything that's on Google. Whereas we talk about the 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 things that are not on Google, and and what we're asking people to do is to not tr- take a chance on us. You shouldn't take a chance on someone. You should take a chance on the process. And and similarly to the to the, um, the you know building a pool. I love the topic of of you know are we spoiling our children? Listen, our children have been very well off since they were born. Right. And in part it was because I was very well off in in corporate America. In part it is because we do very well for ourselves now. But it never was. We never put it from the perspective of what we owned. We always put it from the perspective of what is it that they enjoy doing? What is it that we enjoy doing? We enjoy traveling as an example. So when the question of the pool comes up, it's, listen, we we, we have a pool that's exceptionally close to us within three houses. Do we want to focus on putting a pool in our backyard or do we want to travel? And so we actually involve the kids in those discussions. And guess what? 
if anybody and when anybody talks to our children, they go, oh, my God, they're well-rounded individuals. Well, guess what? It's not because they were raised with their silver spoon. It's because they were raised as part of conversations. Yes. And money conversations are very, very important in families. And unfortunately, they just don't happen because mom and dad have the bad mindset about money. And as a result, they're passing it on to, down to the kids. And we're just raising future generations without that solid backbone when it comes to we can and we should do better for ourselves. So um, I've been told these three mindsets when it comes to money, and you may have other ones from your experience. There's the poverty mindset, and that's where folks just, you know, they start to get ahead and then they fall back because they grew up in the world of poverty, of food stamps and government assistance and all these things. And I've seen it happen because of my wife's work in organizations trying to help single moms who are in that situation. She's like, oh, you're doing so good, and then I'm going to move to a different city and quit my job. What? You know, and then go backwards because, oh, this doesn't feel comfortable. Then there's a scarcity mindset, which I think most people are in. Scarcity meaning I'm just going to hoard my money and I just want to lose. So my focus isn't how much I can gain. My focus is I don't want to lose, which is maybe the example you provided with the mm -hmm. dental uh, uh, owner. And then there's abundance thinking, right, where money works for me. I don't work for money. Um. I believe in me, talk about dignity. I believe in my own strength, my own worth. And I'm going to bring me to whatever I do and I will be rewarded because of it, because I add value. Um, I have enough evidence that I add value. So it's not something I need to worry about. It's only something I need to think about. 100%, I would I would say I just love the way that, that you you focus on the three. Could there be more in between possibly? Um, we don't really work with a lot of individuals that are in the poverty mindset, right. but we do see a lot of scarcity mindset, a right. lot of scarcity mindset. And it typically comes in the form of, uh, I'll just go down the street and it's like, but what if, have, have you thought about a truly comprehensive, truly customized way of not just thinking about money, but thinking about the multifaceted approaches that you have to embed amongst your broader financial team. Mm -hmm. And when we get to the team, people go, hmm, I never thought about that. Well, why didn't we think about it? It's because we're programmed to think that we have a him or a her. We've got a CPA, you've got a financial advisor, you've got a wealth planner, you've got maybe an attorney that helps you with some of the stuff on the financial side. But how many times are they talking? Well, they're not. Should they be? Of course they should, because if they're not talking at every single missed opportunity for them to get on the same page, you're losing money. Not only that, but if you have a team that's not integrated, which is exactly what we do for our clients, we make sure that their team is integrated. They don't come to us because they want their team displaced. If somebody isn't playing nice in the, in the sandbox, we'll know, the client will know. But if they're not playing nice in the sandbox, the same strategy that a CPA might advise a client versus or a tax pro might advise a client versus a financial planner might advise a client. Sometimes they could actually go head to head. Sometimes they can cancel each other out. Who wants that? Right. So not only are we losing money, but now the strategies are canceling each other out because there's a lack of strategy. There's a lack of integration. So think about the client that I was just mentioning, you, mentioning uh, to you about with uh, owning the dental practices. The equivalent of the car analogy is he's driving a Ferrari. He has a company that's worth more and is generating more revenue than most business owners out there ever will. And he has no plan. Mm. No plan for what to do with the company, no plan for what to do with the money that comes out of the company. And so the idea is we'll just invest back in the company. Well, he's already lost companies before. So if everything that we do is we just put back in the company, sure, it might be the best return that we can ever get, but how do we plan for us right. on an individual basis? And so it, it becomes very complex from a mindset because now we're straddling the, the personal and the business for most of our clients and then the in-between and then we add on the children and the legacy and all of that. And it just becomes for us a beautiful game, a beautiful puzzle that we have to solve. So what's a breakthrough moment for you when you're with a client and all of a sudden you see the light bulb go on, whether even before they sign on or they're with you, like, um, do you see this like moment where they're like, oh my gosh, now I get it. And, and, and can, you just, can you describe that? Like maybe a scenario or, or something that what helps the light bulb go on? 
So the light bulb, light bulb goes on typically when they see how we integrate the broader team. And and there's so many examples of pop, pump, pop up in my mind, but I'll focus on one. Um, it was a client that came to us. It was actually as a referral uh, by their legal counsel because the legal counsel said, oh my gosh, Inicia, they, these, this particular individual, this particular comp- these companies really, this, this individual owns multiple companies, they're struggling with taxes in the worst way possible. And so we started working with the client. Long story short, they've they had been uh, using the same CPA firm for many, many years. And when we looked at where they're, ta- they were basically, they're in California and they were paying pretty much 50% of everything that comes and just goes out. And the guidance that they had received was just, if you just pay your 50%, the IRS will never come looking. Well, the IRS, even if they ask questions, as long as things are done in accordance to the tax code, then why are people afraid, right? Sure. And so and so we continued on the discussion and there was an, a huge opportunity for us to help them minimize the risk risk exposure. And as a result of that, there was a huge tax component to it as well, a tax, tax savings component to it as well. And so we talked to the client, client loved the idea, risk had been an issue for them for a long time. And the question was, what's next, Genesia? And so the response was, we need to make sure that the CPA team is on board. And if they're not on board, we need to provide the right support for them to understand the strategy so that they understand that first and foremost, it it was a business need. And the tax implications or the tax savings are coming as a result. We're not starting with that first. And so... The idea was, okay, so we jumped on a call with the CPA, we described the strategy, we described how it was going to help impact the company, and the CPA comes out and says, oh my gosh, that in itself is basically going to save you 50% on your taxes. And so when we were talking about numbers, the, their tax exposure was significant, and the tax savings would have been equally as significant. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Their their opportunity was actually in the millions. But but the idea was let's go conservative. Sure. So they did that, and the CPA out of nowhere said, "Unicia, I am so happy that you guys are bringing this discussion to the client because I have a lot of clients that are using this exact strategy for their businesses, and it helps tremendously with their taxes." And you can imagine the client's jaw just dropping all the way down to the floor. Why? Because they had been working with the CPA firm for many, many years. And they had been servicing clients and providing either visibility or they were supporting clients that were in similar strategies. And so when the client heard that, the question was, why, why, Unicia? Why wouldn't we know about these things if the CPA firm already knows that other clients are doing it? Because it's not their job. That is not what they do. They're working with other clients who might just have that strategy. And the question becomes, what else are we leaving to chance? Mm. So if one particular strategy can can help infuse the company with hundreds and or millions of dollars that can be reinvested back into the company, that can be reinvested back into the economy, that can be reinvested in in allowing the client to 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 do more good. If if people want to donate, if people want to help non 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 for profit initiatives and charitable organizations, that's a great opportunity to do that. But we can only do it if we actually get the money back, right? So that's a, that's a great example that every time I think of not just this client, but individuals that are are good um, good candidates for that particular strategy, it just brings a smile on my face because it's not just powerful, but it's not being talked about. And so that's yeah, that's that's a good example. Well, and I think that the if you look at the CPA culture, like if you look at the lawyer culture. Okay, this is an example as comparison. The lawyer culture is defensive, right? I'm taught to prove you wrong, and so you get defensive a lot. <laughs> that's that's what lawyers do. <laughs> you have a defense. That's they even call it that. If you look at the CPA, what are they trying to do? Protect you from being audited, right? So they yes. can go. I know this will protect you from being audited. So it's not necessarily. It's not. They're not setting you up to fail in that area. However, they're not looking deeper into what's possible because they play it safe. Correct. Where you play it safe, but you're looking, you're being creative. You're looking beyond the standard boilerplate protection model. You know, they make up to this small, they make up to this small. And you're able to get creative and dig deeper knowing your vast, uh, the vast tools that are out there that perhaps they're not really, they, they've seen, like you said, I've seen them do it. But I don't actually. I'm not the one to advise that. Exactly, and so I would I would say creative and 
our clients will tell you that one of my, my favorite words is strategic, right? We have to be strategic. And part of that strategy is figuring out how does the team come together? And listen, Joe, we've been, I can't tell you how many times we've been on the other side of the equation where we try to empower the client with just the knowledge. We bring the broader team to the table and a, a CPA or even an attorney can go, yeah, don't think so. Why? Because they're not aware of those those strategies and it's much easier to claim ignorance and mm -hmm. and and you know maybe in some cases even throw mud because it's harder they're not incentivized by you know the client doing something else it just makes their jobs harder and so then then there's this this adverse adversarial kind of reaction to you know just stick with what you already know the, you mentioned something about about attorneys and uh, not all attorneys are the same not all CPAs are the same not all EAs are the same sure. not all financial advisors advisors are the same. Um, just last week, we were talking with an with an with a business attorney, and uh, he, this individual came as a referral from our, our very very tight network. Who, by the way, these guys and gals, they don't introduce people, they don't introduce companies, and unless they know, like, and very importantly, trust them. Sure. And then more importantly, the, those relationship introductions are not just again, you can't just find them out there. So I reached out to one of our other attorney uh, friends in our in a very tight network, and I said, "We one of our clients needs this particular support. We already have somebody that has been identified, but yeah, there's just some weirdness there." So long story short, jumped on the phone this past weekend with with the attorney that we we got introduced to, and the attorney goes, "Can you help me understand what you do? Like, why am I talking to you and not the client?" And I said, "I said, think of us as." We are literally the guard dogs for our clients. We are that quarterback that will say, I said, you have to put your best foot forward. We're not going to tell the client they have to go with you versus the comp competitor. So when you're looking at, at, at the client's case, we want to know that you're able to think outside of the box in a way that is going to help the client navigate this particular situation and get them on the other side. And he's like, this is brilliant, Unicia. I just love the concept. I love the fact that you're doing this. And I love the fact that you gave me that primer before you even introduced me to the client, because now when I talk to the client, it's going to be so much more meaningful because it comes from an expert's perspective. You understand the problem that's super multifaceted, whereas the client See is, he sees it very myopically, right? He just see the one strand of truth that needs to be addressed. So that's kind of how we operate when it comes to attorneys and making sure that everybody comes together. Well, I see it as an uh, accountability. I mean, you're, you're tying it all together to be accountable. And another thing that I'm hearing is that you are changing the experience and the relationship with money. And when you change the experience, you can change the mindset. So you're actually 100%. giving you're giving people uh, power back for their dollar that they work so hard for, which to me is very dignifying, right? I mean, the the, the efforts we put in, uh, the struggles that um, successful people go through, whether you work for someone else and you're putting in tons of hours and there are no there is no nine to five in your world and you're doing whatever it takes, whether you're entrepreneurial, you certainly know that world, uh, the struggle, the heartache of when things are are not so good um, and you push through to make them good. And so you deserve, if I always believe if you do the hard things first, life will get easier. If you do the easy things first, life gets harder. Uh, and so these folks you're working with did the hard things. I would imagine for the most part, there's always exceptions to the rule with inheritance and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> but even so dignifying the dollars that in that, the last generation, you know, granted you, I think it's, it's just, moral responsibility that we treat money with a sense of reverence and dignity. It's not about worshiping it. It's not about going to that extreme. Um, but there is a lot of hard work that produced some sort of monetary legacy or that will produce monetary legacy. And what you do is you protect uh, that legacy or help create one um, by putting mindfulness around the concept of money, holding it accountable and placing a proper strategy so that the lagging indicator of someone's hard work, which is money, the outcome, is uh, celebrated, is respected, dignified, and held accountable to those who have the privilege of interacting with it. Yeah, you, what you said is so, so powerful, Joe. So powerful, and, and I will say, to put it again into context of, of examples, when we work with, 
successful individuals that have, they've earned a lot, they've built, they've already built a legacy for themselves, but they still have this weird relationship with money. They're afraid of money. They're smart in their own right. Think of, you know, physicians, surgeons, sure. think of dentists, think, think of successful, successful individuals. But they have this feeling of, again, I'm not worthy enough. I don't make enough, even though they're making more money than the rest of the population, sure. right? Um, this may not be the right time. I'm afraid. What happens if I get discovered? What happens if, if the choices that I made could have been better? Maybe I just won't talk about it and it'll somehow revert. What we are finding is that when, when we start working with individuals, and, and you mentioned the word mindfulness and dignity, when with mindfulness, they're allowing themselves to just say, listen, nobody's going to judge me because they should not be judged. So if you ever feel judged by anybody that you work with on the financial side, please run away. Um, <laughs> but once they once they get that, that mindfulness and they realize that, hey, it's okay to be open, let's be open-minded. Let's learn about the different choices that we have, the different opportunities that we have at our disposal. Now the dignity sinks in. And our clients will tell us, and if you ever talk to any of our clients, they'll tell you when I first started working with Unicia or with Excelstra, this is how I was feeling. I didn't know where my money was. I didn't want to see my money. I did not want to face the reality. But because of the process that we undertake, it's not one that's that's intruding. It's not one that makes people feel like, oh my God, I'm going to the doctor. I'm getting dressed down. <laughs> you don't feel like that, right? It should be fun. On the other side comes the dignity. They, You can tell that, hey, I am now in a better place. My kids are in a better place. We have a client um, who will constantly tell everybody out there, my child will be a millionaire within the next 20 years simply because they do some of the strategies that they wouldn't have known if it wasn't for Excelstra. Yeah. And so that that mindfulness definitely and 100% leads to dignity when we have the right approaches and the right tools to help bridge the gap between where we are and where we could be. Well, Inicia, that is amazing. So how do we uh, let let everyone uh, know how to reach out to you or, or connect with you um, if if they resonate with this with this message, which I think is absolutely, absolutely huge. Absolutely. So for individuals that want to learn more, my guidance would be just go to our website, www.excelstra.com. That's Excel. STRA.com, or you can search us for, you can search for Unicia Prey on uh, social media. Uh, we're just about everywhere, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and reach out. If you have questions, it'll be our pleasure to make sure that we get them addressed. And my guidance to you would be, do not, do not put it off because when you put it off, something happens, you know it. And if you're listening to this, you probably will now think about it even more. When you put it off, it will come back up, whether it's because when you go to sleep or when you're thinking about your salary or your income or your revenue or whatever happens, it's still there. It doesn't go away. The moment you actually do something about it, my motto is you will elevate your game to the next level, but you cannot elevate your game to the next level unless you actually step in and are willing to figure out which way is up. So Excelstra.com. Awesome. And the one thing about money that is not... The same for everything is you need time. <laughs> so the sooner you, you start, time. the faster your money can work for you. The sooner it can work on a different level for you. So um, again, Unicia, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to, to, to spend time with you. And, uh, and thank you for the, the dignity you are bringing to the dollar uh, and celebrating people's hard work so that it maximizes their efforts and rains down on their loved ones. 100%. Joy, it was a pleasure. I love the idea of the dignity we bring to the dollar. I might just borrow that. <laughs> <laughs> you go right ahead. I'm Joe Kenninger, another Dignity Dialogue. We'll see you next time. This has been the Dignity Dialogue with Joe Kenninger. Talk at you later. <laughs>